same time, so now we can wait one minute, so we are late, as per tradition of the country. Okay, okay, so I think uh, we can now start. So the first speaker of the last day of the first week is Martina Dalbello, who will talk about uh, the metabolic lens part three. Does it work? Yes. Okay. Um, all right. Good morning again. Um, so today, uh, the, the idea is to abandon a bit the framework of fast and slow growers and instead embrace uh, a bit more these ideas about uh, um, fluxes of carbon, of the central carbon metabolism, or at least uh, ideas around uh, um, why the central carbon metabolism and actually the, right, the direction of the central carbon metabolism might be uh, useful to understand, uh, actually to address this question, that is, how do nutrients shape the diversity and structure of uh, uh, microbial communities? So, but when we think about nutrients, well, it's a bit different compared to temperature or salinity because there is only one, let's say, one axis of variation, temperature and salinity either decrease or increase. Okay, salinity, maybe you can take into account different salts, but in the way we think about salinity, it's mainly increasing or decreasing. While for nutrients, while we can think about many ways nutrients can vary, um, and all these ways nutrients can vary actually can affect uh, how species interact and how community assemble. So, and what are these axes of variation? I mean, it's pretty straightforward. One important axis of variation is the concentration of nutrients. So how much of each nutrient is available or how much is the total of all the nutrients available. Um, then another important axis is how many different nutrients uh, uh, microbes can access. Uh, so the number of different uh, type of nutrients. So whether you have uh, uh, one sugar or two sugars or three sugars. Um, and finally, uh, the last important axis of variation is uh, which resources are available, which type of resources. And let's say here I'm mostly focusing on sources of carbon, but the same whole story applies in principle to sources of nitrogen and phosphorus, micronutrients, you name them. But basically, you, there are different ways of thinking about different type of resources. You can think about sugars and organic acids, the way Otto was describing them, but also um, you can have uh, uh, recalcitrant or labile uh, carbon sources, depending how easy it is to break them down and uh, consume them. So, and today I will try to go through, um, in a kind of systematic way, how you can approach uh, these different uh, axes of variation of nutrients. And the first thing that uh, it's pretty easy to, well, uh, to approach is, okay, we have one resource at one concentration, and then, but you have many, so it's one resource available in the environment at a fixed concentration, and, but there are many types. And we already, we have already seen that uh, Despite, every, uh, despite the general belief is that if there is one resource, you should have only one species coexist uh, surviving at equilibrium by the because of the principle of competitive exclusion. In reality, you have many, many species coexisting even when you provide only one source of carbon. And the other important thing is that, uh, um, well, it follows that uh, if you don't have just one species surviving, you can have many. And this diversity or richness or number of species can vary depending on a carbon source. So why, why should we be, let's say, a bit surprised uh, based on experiments that when we provide one carbon source, uh, we see many species? Well, recently, um, Alvaro Sanchez Lab 
put out a paper showing that, uh, well, not very surprisingly, because if you do pairwise experiments, it happens pretty often, is that in, if you assemble communities uh, of two species uh, at different fractions uh, in minimal media with glucose and one co at one concentration, and you ask uh, what's the most, uh, let's say, probable outcome of the, uh, of the outcome is, well, it's competitive exclusion. So um, they tried, I don't, I don't remember how many of these, well, you can count it, but it's not important, but they tried many, many of these uh, uh, pairwise competitions, and the outcome is, well, you have more than half uh, that uh, uh, end up in a competitive exclusion outcome. So people were really surprised, we already seen this paper, when they discovered that uh, actually, when you provide one single source of carbon, again, glucose at one concentration, but you start from natural communities. Uh, in, Josh and Nancy here started with uh, um, communities coming from leaves and soil. They put them in minimal media. They do these daily dilution cycles. Well, at the end of these uh, uh, eight dilution cycles, they find that, well, there are many species coexisting. So here in this plot, you have uh, each of these bars is actually an inoculum coming from a different leaf, a different uh, grain of soil. And you can see that they have many, many species. And even replicates uh, of these inoculum show, well, different species. So the question is, is it just glucose? Is it, what is special about glucose? What about other resources? Well, I did kind of, kind of the same thing. So I started with uh, a grain of soil and um, I, I, I put this grain of soil, so what you do is you go outside, you take this grain of soil, you shake it so that you obtain a bacterial suspension, then you inoculate in this bacterial suspension to minimal media plus resources. And um, you do, I did the seven daily dilution cycles. The important thing, and this is mainly because we had a discussion yesterday, I was shaking the hell out of them. So they were really shaking a lot. So it's not that, I, I don't expect any special structure here. And what we see is that, uh, well, it's not just glucose harboring many, many, many species, but also other, six, other 15 resources. And here you can, you can recognize different sugars, and then we have different disaccharides. Uh, Citer and fumarate are intermediates of the TCA cycle, and then there are sugar alcohols. Uh, this is one weird amino acid that, uh, well, it's actually hydroxyproline that is common in the soil. And we have also uh, cellulose and starch. So here the observation is, well, there is a lot of coexistence in any of these carbon sources. And you can see that on average, there are about 20 species across all these carbon sources. But I think that the other important observation is that diversity varies among all these resources because you can have uh, uh, this, for example, intermediate of the, T of the TCA, TCA cycle harboring about uh, uh, 10 dozen species, but then you can go to like sorbitol or cellulose and they harbor many, many more species, about like uh, uh, 30, 40 species. So, and the first, let's say, um, question that we had in mind is, uh, okay, how do we explain uh, that uh, it's not just that you see many species, yes. Okay, the question is, what's the definition of species? Uh, so here the definition of species is uh, amplicon sequence variant. So uh, when we, at the end of the, of the daily dilution cycles, we send, we extract the DNA and uh, we do 16S amplicon sequencing. And here each of the, um, let's say, unit that we count is a sequence that, has, that is different from another one by just one nucleotide. And this is the definition. This variability doesn't change if you agglomerate at the genus level, at the family level, or if you change the metric uh, with which you look at diversity. This is just richness, but you can do it with uh, Shannon uh, or Shannon entropy or uh, the inverse of Simpson that basically start, you started taking into account uh, the abundance of these species. I don't think I have these plots here, but they, I can dig them uh, somewhere. Uh, what was the second one? 
Oh, well, okay. Uh, of course, it depends uh, uh, the number of reads that you have. Uh, and uh, the deeper you, you sequence, uh, you can always, in principle, dig up more species. Um, what? No, um, but maybe I can answer a slightly different question that is, uh, if you have different number of reads per sample, you can downsample at the same minimal um, sampling reads and you don't obtain a different result. So usually you have problems with different, let's say, um, number of reads if you sample from di very different uh, environments. In this case, since we run all these all these samples in the same lane uh, with the same machine with the same preparation, usually don't see big changes. And across all these experiments that I've done, in which I do things in the lab, I bring them to the facility, and then I get the 16s back. The number of reads doesn't really affect how many species you are detecting. But in, but this is the lower bound. In principle, if you go deeper, you might get more. But this requires like different lanes, different machines. At, at the moment, uh, we haven't tried yet. Um, but but the thing is that I, I think it's the opposite, in, in, because in the, in the lab, since we're doing these daily dilutions, you you are selecting for species that can survive the the, the mortality, which is the dilution rate. Um, yes. <coughs> I, I guess from this plot, just two outliers maybe is cellulose, um, or at least one outlier cellulose. But for polysaccharides, you cannot really expect the sort of the same principles to apply because they are broken down in different lengths of the chains, and there is sort of the different number of resources hiding inside a big uh, polysaccharide. So, if I was you know analyzing this data, I would exclude polysaccharides just because they cannot be imported as a whole unit into a cell. Yeah, you can, ex you can ex uh, yes. It doesn't change anything, but it's just no, that no, 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 if you look I, at the champion here, it's a cellulose, and that's not completely fair. No, it's true. I would say that the second one is sorbitol, which in principle can be imported. But no, I, I think it's a fair point. Um, you still see kind of surprising things, for example, the disaccharides. You might say, oh, you can actually maybe import them, and you might expect more species, but it's not the case. And this is true. This is not just this experiment, but other experiments. Um, but yeah, so the problem is, OK, how do you try to understand this uh, variability in diversity? And oh, yes, so this is a question, sorry. So one thing that we get, did at the beginning is, OK, let's look at the um, uh, molecular weight uh, with the idea that, uh, well, if you can quantify in some, in some ways the complexity of the carbon sources, maybe we get an idea of the diversity. Uh, okay, let's exclude these that have very high uh, molecular weight is actually above. Well, it depends also on which type of cellulose you're using, but anyway, let's, let's do the exercise that Sergei was proposing, but let's look at the diversity of uh, the other stuff. Well, you can get many, many different let's say, different richness uh, with basically the same molecular weight. And actually, as I was saying, you might expect that more complex resources like the disaccharides might, might, ha might harbor more species, but this is not the case. So we ruminated a bit uh, on this, uh, and then we said, okay, well, maybe uh, metabolism can help us. And this is a map that you've already seen because Otto, I think, had it on uh, two days ago. But yeah, this is fairly complex. And uh, we didn't want to go into metabolic models because as it turns out, uh, or like um, you need a lot of data as input. And so sometimes they give very weird results. So we said, oh, maybe let's avoid metabolic models. Let's do a very simple thought exercise, which it is wrong, but it's a thought exercise that, that by the way, might, might be helpful. And it is OK. Can we understand? from, let's say, these metabolic maps that there, are, that there are on kegs, the number of uh, metabolic intermediates uh, that in a generic ensemble of microbes can produce starting from each of the carbon sources that I'm providing in the media. 
And um, this is, you can, this analysis is called scope expansion analysis. And what you need to perform it is uh, the generic ensemble of microbes. And we said, oh, we're in soils. More or less, that's the species that we get, but it's not very defined. Then some currency molecules, so you need ATP, you need acetyl-CoA, so the cell needs to be able to function. And then you input the supplied resource. And in this case is, again, either glucose or sucrose, so on and so forth. And um, so maybe we, this is a very simplified map that you get. Um, and this is not actually the map that we get with this exercise, but the idea is that, uh, well, you can basically place uh, all these carbon sources in a map uh, and try to understand how many metabolic intermediates uh, you get, starting from each of them. And you already recognize that there are some, meta especially the, so all the sugars, um, so the glycolytic substrates are all in this upper part, um, and um, it takes a while for them to go into the central carbon metabolism. While for other um, carbon sources like the TCA intermediates, they are already on the backbone of the central carbon metabolism. So the result of this thought exercise is, is a predicted number of metabolites that, is, that are the intermediates that can be produced. And we are making this huge assumption, which is not true probably, that in principle, each of these metabolites can be released in the environment and can be a substrate for the other species. Again, this is not realistic, but it's a thought ex exercise. But anyway, what we get is that the richness of uh, our uh, communities correlates decently with, let's say, we can say the position of the carbon source in this uh, metabolic map. I see that you're very disgusted. Tell me. I can't hear you. Uh, yeah, no. So how do you mean the intermediates that can be produced? I mean, for citrate, if you f uh, feed into the TCA cycle, then you can also do gluconeogenesis. So I don't really understand. But you don't, understand. Go, you don't produce starch in principle. Yeah. As in this kind of toy network, how many of the things you can go to? Yeah. OK, I see. But you still do gluconeogenesis, et cetera? Yes. With citrate? OK, yes. I see. Thank you. You're welcome. No, but it's, it's, again, this is not extremely realistic, but it was trying to get an idea whether the position uh, at which the resource enters the, metaboli the, the metabolic network that basically is also a bit dividing between glycolytic and gluconeogenic substrates can give us an idea of the number of species that, that you can support in the media. And it gives us a decent idea. Yes? You know, okay, so citrate, fine, citrate fumarate together, but say compare citrate and the uh, glycerol. I would imagine that there's, there's just, other than glycerol, I mean, everything's the same. Why you have 10, 10 metabolites more for glycerol than for citrate? I think because it takes a bit to get into the, into oh, the. But, but all the intermediates, the, the cell I mean, this is anyway. not the exact mass. The citrate, you see it's in the TCA cycle, right? Yeah. Glycerol takes one step to glycerol 3 phosphate, which uh -huh. is uh, so naturally, I mean, you know, this, it, because it's part of metabolism, you have to make membrane and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. So the thing is, when you look at these maps, different species, so we don't have just one species. Yeah. So what makes a bit more, so what makes actually this expansion for the glycolytic is that from different, uh, if you get different species, they can have slightly different pathways uh, to go from. Yeah, but the glycerol too, I mean, because you need everything else other than glycerol, I mean, you, you know, you, you have all these substrate anyway for, 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 for just regular metabolism. No, no, you need them, but let's say if you start from, if, let's say if yeah. you start from glycerol yeah. and you add acetyl-CoA and ATP, that you get all of them, uh, right? Uh, yeah, so, so just, just one, but how do you get 10? Why only one? So because you get all right, of so these, right? Citrate, the difference between citrate and glycerol on the x-axis, I think there's like 10. Uh, yeah, no, but not glycerol, 10, okay, glycerol also goes through here, so honestly, I think, so this is something that we did through the maps. And it's possible that the reason why glycerol has, has more is because there are 
different pathways. I'm not, I'm not sure about glycerol. Oh, I mean, it's, it's, okay. It's got phosphorylated. That, that, that's Sorry? Right. Yeah, but similarly for many of the other ones, maybe, but I don't. Uh, yeah. Okay, but this is not that's, the. Ooh, this is this is not the map. Wrong, eh? There's a basic set of metabolites that mm -hmm. we shall be making anyway. Yeah. Make a threshold in concentration, but I don't. I, I don't no, know here what. no. There is no threshold in concentration. But it's then, but then uh, the the. I mean, yes. I mean, if you okay, if you uh, well, and the sucrose just breaks down to glucose. I mean, I would just say okay, so that's one away. But the why is glucose and. Uh, and, uh, and uh, say citrate so many numbers away, because glucose, you, you, the glucose, step, we don't, we, glucose well, the gluconeogenesis faster. stops around here, right? So in principle, you have more. Yeah, no, glucose one step go to glucose 6-phosphate, and it's, yes. which is always made by, you know, you still need it to do things. So, okay, don't get me wrong. This is what the, the analysis spits out. We checked a bit the different pathways if you are, and it seemed reasonable. We can check again all the pathways. You're, you're, you're following some algorithm that I'm okay. I, I, don't, I don't understand. Okay. Now, the basic set is the same, and I think that's the whole idea. So, okay, we can, let's say, we don't, I think that in general, you can, you can, we can agree that with suc, with glue, with, sorry, with sugars, in principle, you have a larger diversity of pathways to which you, you go to the, But different species have different pathways. Yeah, but for example, if you are a, if you are a, if you are a, um, a, an enterobacter, some bacteria can do both the EMP and the ED, and this counts as two pathways. So that's why you expand. But anyway, I'm curious to see how you get to the, the ten. Yeah, we can we can look at the scope expansion analysis, uh, and but this is something that we get out. Uh, and we checked from MetaPsych, and it seemed reasonable what we got. Okay, fine. Um, uh, question. Yes. So actually, come. I just wanted to say that this is testable, right? You take the spent medium from two different experiments. Oh with no. Two no. Spent media experiments are a pain, and pain, uh, but the people do them. <laughs> no, I did them, but I don't think you get. And it, you, you can't really but relate you, this you thing. should at least uh, statistically find uh, uh, different secreted metabolites in so two what very I different, like what you I could see? take the two extremes. Okay, what I see, for example, is that uh, if you feed, uh, uh, let's say, glucose to a species that can't do like, uh, um, the, um, so cannot ferment, you get less metabolites and other stuff that they cannot use, for example. But this is through species. And then getting exactly, yeah, we can look at spent media experiments. I don't think they tell you exactly what we're showing here. Uh, but again, this was a thought exercise. And I know that uh, I, I would get this, so I was waiting for it. But I say, the idea is, and we can, and I don't know, that if you have sugars in, and you have different species, you have different ways of getting from the sugar to the central carbon metabolism. If you get the TCA intermediates, there's no way you have diversity in the pathways. They all enter the... Based on some pan-genome, because you don't even know which sequences, there are many of them. That it's a pan-genome. So we take... The, the, uh, which pathway are you following? I mean, yes, there are different, uh, different metabolic networks for different organisms. Exactly. Uh, yeah, but, but, but so which ones are you following? I'm following a bunch of species that, that were in our experiments and that are in the soil. So when we get them the, from KEG, it's not just one genome, it's just, it's no. a pan-genome. You can select for soil species on the keg. Yeah, but so, so like when you put a number out there, you're referring to particular species? I mean, you have so many species. I'm not right? referring to a So a what, do you, what do you do? Like when Maltos, you said there are 34, uh, predicted number of metallic 34, you, this is based on an average of coming from a different, you don't know? You all know, of them. Huh? What all does of mean, them. all of them? Because in, in principle, different, so, so you get, let's say, you have, you, have five, uh, you have five species. Yeah. Let's say you have five ways of uh, producing yeah. these metabolites. Yeah. You count all of them. You add up all of them. I add them. I don't add, okay. I don't add up the, the, the five glucoses that they can produce, but I add the metabolites that are not the same. Okay, okay, so that explains part of it. The, the, yeah. but then, so you're, you're, you know enough about your, 
your species at each one, you have a metabolic network? That's the thing. I'm not doing that. I'm just saying, I, ha I don't know exactly what I have about my species, but in CAG, you can say, okay, can I get a bunch of soil species that might be representative of the sample that I have, and I, and I consider all of them? Okay, okay. at least I get an idea what you're you doing. Okay, great. Right. Let's move on from this. Um, so, and the question is, okay, what happens if you add more resources to the game? And what we did, how we did the experiment was, uh, uh, okay, no, first I w I'm, tell I'm telling what you see. So when we go from, and so here we're going from one to two resources and then from two to many resources, we still are at the same concentration of carbon and we still have many, type of, many types of resources. What we see that was quite unexpected is that f going from one to two resources, we don't see an increase in diversity, but actually uh, an averaging effect that uh, it's still bothering us. And the other thing that we see is that richness increases only modestly, but linearly with the number of supplied resources. Okay, let's go from one to two. So what we did in the, in the experiment was starting from these uh, 16 carbon sources and mixing pairs of them, like in a tournament. And so for example, we end up mixing glucose and hydroxyproline. And then we started saying, okay, when we mix them, what's the expected richness in the, uh, in the, in, in, in the, in the mixture of glucose and hydroxyproline? And here, since we are keeping the, um, sorry, since we are keeping the total carbon concentration constant, it means that there is half of this carbon that is due to proline and half of this carbon that is due to glucose. So this is the richness that we observed in single, res in single resources. So hydroxyproline is about is 11 species, glucose was 24 species, and we ask, okay, if we combine them, what's the expected richness? So if we believe this whole pathway thing where we can say that each species represent, is represent, so each metabolite then corresponds to one species, we might say, okay, the, um, what we can expect is that the, when we combine these two resources, we, we get the, the union of the species. And this is something that actually was observed in a previous study that is published on PNAS where they were looking at um, um, co communities from uh, the phycospheres, uh, and they were looking at combining different carbon sources. So in the union would say about 30 species. Well, the other possible prediction is that while well, you don't exactly get the union, but still get the maximum, if the, really the concentration of carbon matters and sets the number of species that can be supported, well, maybe it's the maximum of these two carbon sources. So it's going to be 24 species. But then we do the experiment and we found that actually what we observed is not the union, not the maximum, but actually the average uh, number of species of glucose and proline. And again, this might be a special case, but actually when we looked at all the different uh, combinations, I think we had about 24 combinations, this is true across many of them so that on average, when, we com when you combine two resources, you get uh, the average number of species of the two constituent singles. Which also, so this is a, a lot to take, but basically here you have the number of, uh, the richness in single resources, the richness in combinations, and each line goes to uh, the, so the, how the, uh, the, indicates the pair. And uh, you see that uh, you get many lines that cross in the middle, indicating that uh, the richness in the pair is actually the average of richness of the constituent singles. So, which means that basically, if we start plotting the richness as a function of the number of supplied carbon sources, what we see going from one to two is that the diversity doesn't really increase. So it stays basically the same. And I didn't tell you before, but then we tested also combination of four, eight, 15, and 16 species. And I'm, gonna plot, I'm going to plot how diversity changes as we increase the number of resources in the mixture. And it's a tournament, so again, 
in principle, you can go back to all the different constituent resources. So you see that basically region increases only weekly, but um, it's pretty striking that it increases linearly with the number of resources. And just as a reference, this is the line that you might expect from competitive exclusion. So basically, we are seeing that there is an offset, so you get more species coexisting in one resource, but then the way you are actually increasing the number of species kind of follow the uh, competitive exclusion principle, because you're adding one or two species for each new resource that you add in the media. Does it matter which four you put together? So of course this is a sample, and it was completely random. Mm -hmm. so, so the way we assemble the four is, is random. So again, it's a tournament. So oh, I, don't, I, see. Okay. So, oh, yeah, yeah. I don't think, so I don't have a way of telling you whether it matters oh, okay, or not, okay. but. So, uh, so this is just a collection of all. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a random. Uh, and, and the reason the scatter is less for the higher number is just that you, you, you run out of uh, combinations. Well, with 16 resources, I can only do one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, so of course this is, um, I don't remember, this is 24, uh, what is 16, 8, so, and then with the, I have all the possible combination of uh, all minus 1, and then I have the 16. And we did basically three combinations, three, three tournaments. Is this including the polysaccharides? Yes. I, I, what, I see. Hmm. So if you, have you done it without... Excluding the uh, policy. Yeah, it doesn't change that much. Um, so if you exclude them here, you are excluding this blue dot here. So this blue is the cellulose. And the starch is not that high, so it's somewhere around here. And then actually, maybe, um, let me go back here. So this is where cellulose goes uh, when you combine it with something else. So actually, even, if, even when you exclude them, since there is this averaging effect, it doesn't change that much, the whole picture. So, but the point is, it doesn't increase that much. And um, it's not, uh, and I wanted to show that this is not just our result. So uh, in the lab of Daniel Segre, they did a similar experiment, but starting with isolates, so not with the natural communities, but they were mixing uh, some isolates. And they went to actually to 32 resources, and of course you get the fairly raw richness because they didn't have that many isolates. I started with the natural community that had like 700 species. But still you see, so the, the black line is the experiment, then these are consumer resource models, but let's forget about these two. The experiment shows that actually going from one to two, so from one to two is where actually you get a decrease in richness, and then you start increasing, but the increase is very, is very modest. So it's not, I think this is, it's not just us saying this, uh, look, looking at this result, it might, it's something that other labs have seen. And so the question is, okay, why do we see this uh, uh, pretty striking trend of riches increasing linearly with the number of resources? And so we started saying, oh, maybe we can look at community structure and get some ideas. So, and my idea here was trying to tell you what was our thought process when we went through this data. It took us a while, and, uh, it's, and so the idea is that I, I, I'll tell you, okay, what we, how did we think about it? And then, actually, I'm going to fill in what other people found a couple of years later that actually was kind of consistent with our thought process. Okay. Um, we have already seen that there are different ways at which we can we can look at the community structure. We can try to coarse grain in different ways. Uh, you can do a coarse graining based on resource occupancy. So basically, uh, trying to understand which species you found in every resource or in every combination of resources, and you can call it an habitat generalist, or if you find other species that instead are more um, associated with uh, a single resource, then you can call them habitat generalist. Or, you can, uh, let's say, coarse grain based on consumption patterns. For example, you can, use the, you can use the sugar acid preference that Otto showed two days ago. And finally, you can do the mainstream thing that is uh, try to do based on taxonomy. And for example, you can look at the family level instead of the ASV level that, we, that 
uh, Alvaro sh uh, showed it was pretty messy. So let's start with the mainstream, mainstream way. So this is again data from uh, Alvaro's paper that shows that when you look at communities uh, at the ASV level, so these uh, single nucleotide differences, uh, you might think, oh, it's a mess. But then when you look at the family level, actually you see um, a higher level of, uh, let's say, consistency across communities. And so we ask, okay, what's the level of consistency going from single resources to 16 resources? So, and we took, let's say, a um, slightly different approach. So we trained the model, um, XGBoost, uh, three regression model, not important, on our data in uh, um, single resources. And so actually we had all the data set and we trained the model on a percentage of the data. And the input was the uh, relative concentration of the resource and the final abundance of each family that we saw in, in, the, in the community. And based on this model, we, we end up finding very strong associations between the family and the resource. And then what we did was plotting the uh, relative concentration, the relative abundance of uh, some of the families that showed a very strong association as a function of the relative concentration of the resource that was identified as uh, their favorite. Is it clear? So here you see, for the Pseudomonas, which are um, one of the abundant families, especially in the, in the organic acid, and actually hydroxyproline, you see that the relative abundance of this family increases very well with the relative concentration. So there is a very, very nice correlation between the relative abundance of this family with the, uh, let's say, um, the relative concentration of this resource. And these, let's say, enterobacteria are kind of the nemesis of the pseudomonas. Um, Usually, the pseudomonas feed on the byproducts of enterobacteria, and you can see that in the same resources, actually, the enterobacteria, which cannot consume many of these uh, uh, TCA intermediates, or at least are less, are less good at consuming these TCA intermediates, decreases uh, with the concentration of these resources. By contrast, enterobacteria really like silos, and so they increase accordingly to the, to the uh, percentage relative concentration of xylos in all the multi-resource communities while pseudomonas decreases. Then there are, there, there are other families that for which we found associations that were pretty strong. For example, for the, the, baci, the bac, bacillace, they, are, they, they reach a, decent, a, a higher abundance in when you have a lot of cellobios. And it's the same for the cell vibrionace that can degrade cellulose they reach a decent, a, let's say, 0.2% abundance, 0 0.2 abundance when, you, uh, when cellulose is present. So I've never actually shown this data. They are very hidden in the paper. But I thought that this might be a good place to discuss them because we see associations. And actually, you don't really need to. So this is actually, so you can train a model to find these associations. And then to, you can verify whether you see some pattern. And I think this is a very beautiful, beautiful pattern that is in agreement with the fact that uh, uh, there are strong associations between families which can, are thought to be the functional unit uh, of the taxonomy and uh, the resource that we put in the media. And these associations remain when you have mixed resource environments. Okay. Can I ask a question? So in terms of contribution to diversity, um, so if you look at the... Diver I don't know what is my question, but if you look at the diversity within uh, uh, Pseudomonace, how does it change as a function of the resource? So what I'm saying is how much of the diversity that you see, uh, for instance, the, 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 the variation of diversity that you see is due to the variation of the relative abundance of enterobacteria versus Pseudomonas? I don't think we really looked into that. So it might be nice to check. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting plot. And uh, what, what jumped at me are indeed those two right columns where you only reach any non-zero abundance if this is the only resource. Yep. And again, given that it's uh, cellulose is one of those culprits uh, and cellobios, it may be due to the fact that the growth on those resources is extremely slow. You need to sort of break them up. So if, you, if those resources are given in the mixture and you are a specialist in those resources, you will, be, you will be wiped out by other species. So it kind of makes sense. Did you see it for other polysaccharides? I, I believe you had one more if I yeah, start, well, starch. I think there Maybe was, it's a little bit easier degraded. Yeah, I, I have plots of this for many. I don't remember for starch, but I think the, so we were looking, the, I think the model identified the, the identified something for starch too. We can, I can check again. Yes, so this is uh, the relative concentration of the resource in the multi-resource environment. So for example, so is this 100% only in one condition? It can be 50% again in only one condition, but then it can be 25% in, in the four conditions. So, uh, so this is, um, the colors indicate how many resources you had, and then, then where you don't have it. Okay. You're not convinced. Okay, I don't understand the plot anymore. You don't understand the plot. So this is when you have only, a, only hydroxyproline, 100%. This when you have 50% hydroxyproline, this is when you have two resources. This is when you have four resources, uh, then is eight resources. Okay, no, no, I understand now, but then what surprised me is the how small is the bar, uh, how, how small is the variation. So the, the bar is the standard deviation. Is the standard error. Not the standard error. And actually this huge bar, it means that probably even when there is only uh, cellulose, not in all replicates, they were present actually. So that's the bar, because for each resource we had three, three replicates. Okay, um, but then this kind of now back the question. So we know that bacteria show strong preferences for either sugars or organic acids, and so I was discussed, and we saw this before, right? Uh, I don't have to go through it. So basically, if you, you can assign this sugar acid preference uh, score, it's positive and goes towards one if the species prefers sugars, and, and uh, it goes towards minus one if you have acids, and this depends uh, on, let's say, the abundance of pathways uh, uh, for sugars and for acids. And, um, and since you can, and since this um, SAP can be predicted from sugar acid pathways abundance in the genomes, well, I chatted with Matti and we said, well, maybe we can look into it in my communities. And what we found is that um, this is the percentage of sugars enrichment in multi-resource combinations. So you see that it, it, it can increase and become um, 100%. This is 100% corresponds to the minus one uh, so 16 minus one that don't have the acids. Uh, you can see that the sugar acid preference goes from uh, being close to zero to actually uh, starting to be uh, close, uh, going towards uh, more sugar preference. And I thought this was interesting because in reality, when you look at communities, um, yes, you find several, so you never, even in the sugars, I believe, you don't find just uh, uh, sugar acid, so species that prefer sugars, you also get species that prefer acids, which is consistent with this idea that uh, if you provide sugars, uh, many species can also like um, excrete acids and these acids can be taken up by the as, um, species that prefer the acids. So, but then this um, kind of fed in into um, another thought exercise that was in our paper uh, that is, okay, we've seen this uh, map, very simplified, all the problems of the case that we discussed before, but let's say, I think that it's okay to say that uh, if you start from different resources, uh, you might have uh, metabolites that are always produced by everyone, 
And then you can have instead metabolites that instead can be produced only by a few resources. And so we decided to plot, and so this is, it's very simple to count, right? If, if in our scope expansion analysis, uh, we found a metabolite uh, that was produced by more than 12 resources, then we call it common. If it was uh, produced by less than three resources, we call it rare. And if we plot the uh, predicted number of metabolites uh, and we, let's say, color the bars based on whether the metabolites are common or uh, rare, we see that um, every, in principle, every resource produces this, of course, every resource produces common metabolites, but then only with the sugars, basically, you get these rare metabolites. It is the picture that I was trying to say before that you get diversity in the pathways only when you have sugars and not when you have organic acids. And this is our, let's say, working hypothesis here. And this was kind of, um, um, we were quite happy when we saw actually that if you do the same exercise with species, so here you have these are plotting the various resources. These are all the species that we have. And then you can ask, okay, how many times this species is present? In how many resources this species is present? And you can get, again, some species that are only present in a few resources, other species that instead are present in many, many resources, basically all of them. And then there are a bunch of intermediate species. And the plot looks similar to what to the plot that we just seen before. So basically there is, um, so the distribution of species that then can be identified as habitat generalist if they are found in every single resource or habitat specialist if, the, if they are found in one or few resources kind of mirrors the distribution of metabolites. And this was our idea to try to understand Ah, uh, wait, I have another slide before going there. Let's see, what time is it? Well, plenty of time. Um, what happens if we ask this, if we see how these generalists and specialists uh, um, behave in the moment we look at multiple resources? So here is the same plot of the richness increasing with the number of carbon sources. And you can see that these generally species that we see in single resources kind of remain the same across all the combinations. So there is a core number of species that are always there, no matter the combination of resources, which resources are present. And then there are, and actually the increase in diversity depends on these specialists that increase as we provide more resources in the media. And of course you have also a gray bar because since we're starting from, let's say, a big inoculum, uh, you can get differences. So the gray species are actually the species that the, were not present in single resources, but then appeared when we looked into multi-resource environments. Yes? Can you, can you say something about why you, what you think to see these gray species? Do you think this is a sampling thing, or do you think maybe this has to do with concentrations or something like that? Mm, okay. For sure there is the fact that, uh, so when we start these experiments, you have this inoculum, and so it's not exactly the same species that you are inoculating in each well. So each well have a, has a sample of species that belongs to the same pool but might be different. The other thing is that it is possible that if you have more resources, you can actually support, uh, you can produce a slightly different metabolic pool, so you can get actually new species that you couldn't support before. So I think it's both. But I'm more inclined to say there is a huge, uh, let's say, effect of the pool that is the same, but then you get different inocula. Um, up. <laughs> Two, okay. Okay, so <clears throat> if I understand correctly, you define like a specialist and a generalist depending on how many uh, resources well, I mean, when you supply different resources, like in how many resources you see that single species, yes. right? But then in, in my head, when I hear specialist and generalist, it, it means that like that species can grow on that specific resource. So how do you know 
if, because, for example, if you see a species in the starch community or in the cellul cellulose community, how do you know if they can actually eat the cellulose on their own or they are like eating something that is being produced in the metabolic cascade, let's say, that comes from the degradation of it? Yeah, so fair point. Uh, I'm, called, I'm calling them, where is, uh, ah, not here, but in the paper I called them habitat generalists and specialists <laughs> because I don't exactly know about uh, their consumption patterns. Um, so what I can tell you is that uh, I know afterwards, now I'm doing experiments with isolates, uh, and I know that uh, there is a fair amount of species that we find uh, in the communities that actually cannot grow by themselves uh, in the carbon source uh, where we find them. And doesn't mean that they cannot consume the carbon. I think uh, I heard you, uh, because also I don't know how many, how many, but since we find them, I think they can grow fast enough uh, so that I can see them, but maybe they're missing a cofactor that someone else is providing, an amino acid that someone else is providing, a vitamin. So there might be several reasons for, uh, for, not, not them, for them not to be able to grow. Uh, but from this data, here is just, uh, let's say, a habitat. You can call them cosmopolitan or uh, uh, what's the opposite? Uh, well, <laughs> so let's say the generalists are the cosmopolitan, the specialists are the rare species. Um, all right. So, so the picture that we're trying to build here is that in our communities, uh, given what I just told you, so the previous six slides, our idea is that these habitat specialists are actually these, sorry, microbes that um, tend to prefer glycolytic substrates and might actually prefer this glycolytic direction of the uh, central carbon metabolism, while these habitat generalists that we see everywhere might actually might be species, uh, sorry, uh, uh, might be species that instead uh, can be everywhere, but uh, prefer the gluc gluconeogenesis uh, direction of the central carbon metabolism and mainly feed on organic acids. The point is, since in our picture, organic acids can be produced starting from uh, sugars as well, then basically everyone in our community preferentially consume one type of substrate, but since, the, since organic acids are everywhere, these species can be generalists. This is the, our picture for our view of our communities from the data that I showed you before. Based on this, we said, okay, let's try to build a model. So, I'm showing you again this map which is the object of um, problems, but let's say, when we, started, we decided to use a consumer resource model because we are in a resource environment, so let's forget about Lotka Volterra. No phenomenological model today. So, but consumer resource models, what you do usually is that, for example, what Pankaj does, uh, Pankaj Meta and, uh, or did before when he presented this model is, uh, okay, in the consumer resource model, I have the dynamics for the species, I have the dynamics for the resources, and then I have a matrix that uh, describes which species consume what resource and what they leak in the environment. And there are different ways of populating this matrix. One simple way, uh, from a statistical physics point of view, is random. So we decided instead that maybe we can use the information that we got from this matrix and actually all the ideas that I showed you before, that uh, everyone is a specialist for something, but for different things, to populate this matrix. And the assumption that, is ma that we made is that, again, everyone consumes preferentially one resource and leaks in the environment the resources that are adjacent to the consumed resource in our metabolic map, and so on and so forth until you basically reach the bottom of the food chain. And as a, as a side note, um, you can see that the concentration of metabolism for conservation of mass, if you start with one concentration of, me of the resource, the, con the concentration of each metabolite that it's leaked 
in the chain must decrease and decreases as one over R, so the number of resources. So if we do the simulation, keeping this in mind, we finally found that we can kind of recap recapitulate this uh, uh, relationship between the number of resources and the richness that we see in the experiments. And the funny thing is that we kind of also recover this distribution of habitat generalists and specialists that we observed in uh, our data. And yes. You what is what fraction of the nutrient leaks uh, after consuming the primary resource? I don't remember the value. Because we, uh, the, the, this is kind of a sensitive parameter, even if you no, look no, at this, uh, if it's too little. Well, I, I'm pretty sure you use pretty high, because otherwise high. cascades no, no, no. would not it be is, possible. It's not, yes. I don't remember the value, but it's pretty high, because in the end, you have, you have to allow the production of... Uh, it's a long chain that is related to how we constructed the map. And I think we, we, we struggled a lot to try to get the model that was doing all the things that we see in our experiments, and we're still not there. Because, yes, we get some variability from going in single resources, but not much. Then we don't really see the average, averaging effect from one to two resources. So the main result that we're able to recover with this model is actually the linearity in the, in the relationship and a bit this generally specialist stuff, but it's kind of, so this, the built-in matrix, let's say, is um, crucial to get this habit, uh, generally specialist map. So what I'm trying to say is that I really think this model is wrong for many reasons. And actually there is one reason for which it's particularly wrong. Because as I told you before, the other question is uh, how diversity changes with resource concentration. So we have a third axis that we need to explore. Well, maybe not today, uh, but just a sneak peek. So why this model is fundamentally wrong? Because it predicts that the diversity of communities should increase with the concentration of resources. And it's for a, simple model, for a simple reason. So we said, you know, we have this uh, chain that I showed you before, blah, blah, blah. So the concentration of the metabolites decreases as we uh, go towards the end of the chain. So there will be, a, let's say, concentration threshold at which the, the concentration of the metabolite is not able to support anymore the, the growth on one species. This species is excluded. This is what sets diversity. If I increase the concentration, what happens is that I have more, let's say, more stuff that can be converted into metabolites. The chain is longer, diversity increases. So this is a very strong prediction. I think that we were, when we were looking at this, I said, yeah, we have this prediction. It will never be true. And so we said, okay, well, we need to do the experiments to actually verify that it's not true. So what I'm showing you here in one minute is um, an experiment that I did again with starting with several carbon sources and I said, okay, let's focus on, uh, let's avoid polysaccharides, let's just focus on uh, sugars and actually a disaccharide and a trisaccharide, the organic acids and some amino acids. I give them a different concentration and actually at four orders of magnitude change in the concentration. I always start with my soil, soil communities and I do the usual daily dilution protocol, still shaking a lot. And um, what we get and is that, well, for sure diversity is not increasing with resource concentration. So here I decided to divide between uh, sugars and the rest. So with sugars, you can see we have four, or four orders of magnitude change in the concentration. The richness is slightly lower compared to the previous experiments, but I don't have polysaccharides here that kind of rise the, a bit the, um, the average. But you can see that, uh, well, diversity doesn't really change, and if it does something, probably decreases with the concentration. But here I'm plotting the slope, so if I look at the individual slopes of each resource as a function of concentration, they're all kind of spread out, but none of them is actually <coughs> significant. So they're all, none of this relationship with concentration is significant. 
And okay, is it the same if I go to organic acids? The answer is yes. And here I'm skipping the highest concentration because I discovered that uh, M9 buffer is not able to buffer the um, acidification of the environment anymore. And so pH is completely wrong, so those are excluded. But you can see that basically diversity doesn't really change, and if it does something, it's a bit decreasing. And this is, again, the same plot with the slopes for different resources of uh, each point. So the region as a function of concentration. So not a big change. But the question is, maybe a tree structure is changing. Well, I'm just showing you here glucose and malate. Well, for sure, if you look at this, uh, uh, this tree concentration in these organic acids, where there is mostly one family or order dominating structure doesn't change that much. We might see some change in, the carb in, the, uh, in glucose as you increase the concentration, but still there is a lot of variation. So it's, even, it's actually difficult to decide whether to, uh, for sure this you don't see many changes, but here is also difficult to pinpoint how the uh, structure is changing. So I can't go into this, but uh, so I will just, uh, so, what I'm doing now is actually trying to understand from a bottom-up point of view if at least I see changes in the structure of communities and whether I can find any pattern that is related to some sort of general metabolic principle uh, that can explain these changes. Yes? What all did you reach in these samples? Um, so, in the 1%, it's close to 1%. And bef uh, the so for the different concentrations. So one percent is one, and then it's tenfold less. So it's like 0 0.1. So it follows a bit the in the community. It follows really well the so the carrying capacity of the community can be retrieved from the total concentration of carbon very well. Actually, if you go into single species, no. So the so if you plot. I don't have it, but I can show you. So if you plot the, the logarithm of the concentration and the logarithm of the OD, they are on a straight line. Very high, okay. Um, so takeaways. I think that when I started going to resources, while well, I found a lot of surprises, there is a violation of competitive exclusion or effect of concentration that these were all things that were kind of expected. And the other thing is that um, I kind of believe that life strategies linked to the preferred direction of the central carbon metabolism can also help us understand a bit more of how these communities assemble, not just uh, the physiology of single species. And um, well, there is as Terry pointed out yesterday, there is a mismatch in what people measure when uh, they look at what metabolites are secreted with actually the number of coexisting species that we see. And this is kind of a mystery that we haven't really resolved yet. And um, the other point is that uh, the state of the art carb uh, consumer resource models, they're bad, they're wrong. They're not really helping us understanding what's going on in community. So there's a lot of work to do, especially for theorists. <coughs> so, and with this, I didn't thank all the people that uh, helped me with this work. This is my PI at MIT. Akshit and Hian were my collaborators in the resource papers. We're still working on this. Uh, Claire, Karine, and Yaron are my collaborators in the temperature project, Jana. I'm working on, with her on the salinity project, and this is uh, our lab uh, that, well, this was a picture taken while we were moving, so <laughs> you can see the state, the disaster. Anyway, okay, thank you for having me. Uh, of course late, but I think we have time for a couple of questions. Hi, okay. Hi, thank you for this talk. Um, I had a question on the experimental setup. So as far as I understood, you had this 96 well played with different media, like with different number of resources, but the inoculum always came from like this uh, soil like community, Yeah. right? So when you were saying, for example, um, 
when you were uh, going from one single resources to the two and you were saying maybe we will see the union but you actually saw the mean of the species. Did you also try to mix the communities like that had established in the single resources like glucose? Do you expect that you would have the same if you did? Because I'm not sure then if I understood like when you showed the plot of number of resources and richness in species, that you said like we can go back and forth. Like if I have a community that grows with eight resources and I remove four resources, what, no, will no. I see the same richness? Or? No, yeah, no, okay. So the experiments, the, the way you describe it is actually how I did them, so there is no mixing uh, later. But then it becomes a matter of coalescence I think it's a whole different ballpark. Um, I think also Alvaro was exploring these kind of things, uh, so I didn't do that. When I, and when I, what I meant to say back and forth is that uh, you can, let's say, establish a tournament. So if I mix these two resources, uh, and you can try to ask every time, okay, can I predict based on uh, uh, which resources, I, the constituent resources, uh, can I predict something from the communities, the constituents, uh, with the constituent resources on, about uh, the mix? Thank you. Uh, I have a, okay. Uh, okay, <laughs> so uh, I have a question on the last part of your talk when you were explaining that cross-feeding in a linear chain Mm -hmm. So you increase the initial concentration, you would increase the final concentration of the last resource of this chain, so you can increase the richness in this sense. My question is, when you are changing the initial concentration experiments, how are you sure that you already have a community of species that are really able to consume at least one metabolite more in your chain? So, uh, I mean, if you, if you don't know what's the community, how are you sure that you're really changing concentrations and really changing richness? No, 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 I, I don't, I, I'm not sure. This is just to, well, we use models. Uh, we use the consumer resource model. We're kind of assuming the same thing, even if we don't know. So, when you try to ask with this model, how is concent, so it's just how the model would work uh, and what and why is predicting this thing? This is just a cartoon to highlight. Okay, this is why this model predicts that diversity increases with concentration, and actually why it's not working. And it can be because not everyone. Well, you have to also understand. You don't know. Ex you do not actually know what's around. So what they are leaking, and uh, but. This was just to illustrate a bit how the model, in a very simple way, how the model works in terms of predicting diversity from changing in concentrations. This is all very interesting. <clears throat> Did you try to see the effect of the dilution factor just in the spirit of your uh, first talk here? The death should help uh, increase in the dilution, which is kind of equivalent to uh, to death here should increase uh, influence of the of the of the fast growers, right? So it could be interesting experiment to follow up. Yeah, I agree. And what was the dilution factor you used? You may have mentioned it, but I thirty x. Uh huh. What, what, what factor did you? Thirty x. It's a matter of. Uh, like uh, convenience because I, I, I have these deep well plates of 500 ml, so I work at 300 ml, so I can transfer 10 ml, and I don't have to change the head of 30, the... 30x. 30x. So. <laughs> um, I don't have to change the head of the bioflow. <laughs> uh, so, so, so here's a question I had, yeah. like, actually the first time I, I, I heard this gross dilution, no, the first time ever, okay, and I still have this question, and I'm gonna ask, it's a, because it's related to what Sergey is asking. So I never thought, you know, in principle, uh, this diversity will be an issue in, in this experiment uh, because, you know, some cells die and thousands of metabolites are released. Mm. Okay? In 24 people just can munch on whatever. Mm. How do you respond to that? So in 24 hours, there are not many cells that are dying. No. What? How do you know? Alvaro tested it. Huh? 
Alvaro, I think, had this test in his paper, and they have 48 hours. So they stained uh, the dead cells in their communities, and they saw that there was not that much no, but, death. But the dead cells could all be eaten up. Yeah, okay, but then it's like, yeah, uh, <laughs> right, but how do, I, how do I test it? No, no, but no, so, <laughs> so, I mean. No, okay, it, my it assumption is, yeah. is that uh, they're not dying that much in 24 hours. And for, and. Some of our cells die with like a half an hour. That, that okay, then I, I ask you a different question. Yeah. So from my experiments to Alvaro's experiments, I have um, more diversity than he has. And then we're going from 24 hours to 48 hours. In principle, they are dying more over 48 hours. He should see more diversity than me. I mean, we don't. We don't understand. I mean, no, we, no. I'm trying we to understand little about growth. We understand even much less about death. I agree with you, yeah. but from what I know about death is that it takes a while for them to die, right? Huh? It takes a while for them to die. No, not necessarily. Depends on strains. Depends on conditions. Yeah. The other thing, though, that you might be right about about death is that I cannot exclude phages. So if there is a phage like burst, right. because I'm taking them from soil, they can feast. But I think there should be more random path than more, so should be more random changes in diversity. If you observe in the middle, but if you observe at the end, I mean the dead one has died and you know, since they have recycled eventually. You know, you get but don't you think that then there should be more, so when I repeat these experiments, I kind of, they, it, they are pretty consistent. If it would be just a matter of dying of phages and births, should it be more random? That is very regular. I mean, just because we don't study it. No, I think that we, we, no, we're actually studying. No, no, but I, I, so, I, but I think this is actually embracing, no, I, I think that death is a problem. It's not just regular death, I like think is more phage uh, and lysis. Uh, very short gross dilution cycles, but then, uh, the uh, gross period, right? So yeah. then you hardly have anybody dying. Because if they're all growing, I mean, the, you know, if you observe the OD, right, it settles down after a number of hours. No, but I, one thing that I want to do is actually change the dilution period. But, but when you, the concentration, the very low concentration you're looking at, that's very little nutrient, right? That's like, a, you know, sub millimolar, you know, maybe. 100 micromolar type of nutrient. You're, you're talking but they're about far away from. But they're far away from the K, right? Yeah, no, but no, but then then they're just sitting in stationary phase longer. Uh, well, yeah. if you measure growth rate, uh, we can. I show you the. Curve. No, 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 but right, because they're basically not growing, and they're just sitting there. Well, they grow a bit. Otherwise, they they have to grow a bit. For a little bit, and then then they're sitting there, and then that happens when they're sitting there. We can, yeah, we we can look at the curves. Happily. Okay, I think it's a good moment to stop. I mean, it's not a good moment to stop. We could go ahead for, for hours and it will be fun, but <laughs> we don't have unlimited time. Thank you.